So welcome and thank you for joining us again for China is not our enemy. And I'm very excited for this guest we have today because, you know, as we've been looking at the situation with the, you know, U.S. pushing this war on China, we're not listening to the voices that are at the front lines of this war. And we've talked about how Asian Americans in the United States have been the first casualties. But today we, we get to look at surrounding um, what's surrounding China and how they're already paying the price. And also just the anxiety that brings, you know, after the United States has experienced something like 9-11, to terrorize other people, to wave war in front of their faces is, is bad behavior. And it's not good for those people who are in Asia that look at a pending war on China as something that will affect all of them. So I'm excited today to have Seo Saruta with us. She's one of the founding members and the director of the New Diplomacy Initiative, a Tokyo-based think tank for issues around diplomacy. So I'm so happy because at Code Pink, we know how important diplomacy is. Um, after she graduated from Waseda University, she joined an NGO which included helping out in a refugee camp in Tanzania. So she, after passing the bar exam in Japan in 2002, she specialized in international human rights law and received her master's from Columbia University Law School and practiced in New York um, in 2009. In 2012, she received her second master's degree in international relations from the American University in Washington, DC. She was just telling me uh, where she, she got to know Colonel N. Wright, um, one of our uh, superstars at Code Pink. So now she's working on US-Japan diplomacy and um, I'm happy that she's been able to join us today to talk about what are the issues if you are looking at this war from the space of Japan, Okinawa, those places around China, what, what do you see? And also the issue of two nuclear powers. This is, this is frightening for us around the world, but what is it like when you're right next door? So first, Seo, thank you for being with us. And why don't you start by telling our audience why you founded director uh, the New Diplomacy Initiative and um, what are your goals there? Thank you very much for this great opportunity. I'm very honored to be with you today, Judy. And I thank you also, you know, for your very good question about what, why I founded the organization called New Diplomacy Initiative. And also, I actually just, you know, came back from Washington, D.C., but why I would like to go to Washington, D.C. very often, even after my graduation from my uh, master uh, program, you know, I went back to Japan. I moved back to Japan, but I go to Washington, D.C. very often. What I'm doing there is... I think now the diplomacy is just occupied by the people who have a very you know strong power you know people who are in the government and also who don't have a chance to listen to voice from grassroots people in Japan maybe in the United States as well but in my case I'm really afraid of the you know so many diversity of voices exist in Japan like the voice from Hiroshima or like the voice from Okinawa like the voice from you know, voices from Fukushima, but these voices are not heard, not brought to the United States at all from Japan. But, you know, we are the, you know, United States and Japan are the country of you know, democracy, but, you know, our voices are not, you know, reflected at all into the uh, real diplomatic uh, policies, which US and Japan, two governments are deciding every day, every day. So, I would like to bring these voices from Japan to the United States to, you know, it's maybe not very easy. It takes maybe long, long, long time, but try to at least, you know, or let them understand, let them means, you know, the uh, decision makers of the United States, the lawmakers or government officials to understand what we Japanese people really think. Even the voices of the Japanese government is saying this thing, but 
you know, people of Japan have sometimes or very often have different voices which the Japanese government even doesn't want to bring to the United States. That's why, you know, that is my, you know, that is, you know, because of my experience as a student of master, master courses in Washington, D.C. And, and, you know, oh my gosh, in this city, nobody is trying to carry the voices from Okinawan people, from Fukushima people. So, you know, why not me? We should do that. Then I established the organization called New, New Policy Initiative. Then, you know, went to or go to Washington, D.C. very often, sometimes only by myself, sometimes with the diet members, sometimes even former, you know, prime minister, Hatoyama, I went there together with him, like arranging the meetings for him and the counterpart in the United States. That's what I want to do. And that's what, you know, I want to do, try to bring more voices to change the better diplomatic uh, policies in the United States and also, of course, in Japan. Wow, that's impressive. Thank you so much. Yes, because as you said, uh, the people don't always agree with the government. Oh, and okay. people <laughs> we want to hear so what are the people thinking right now um as we're watching japan cozy up to the united states um and become as we know fodder in this war on china um you know we we look at the patterns of the united states and they promise a lot don't deliver anything and use countries and people on the way to their goal and how is that being seen in Japan? I think the you know diplomatic diplomatic channels are very very narrow. I think everywhere in the world. So only voice from the United States to Japan is you know we have to be very tough on China, tough on China. So whenever you know the Select Committee on China uh, in the House of Representatives of the United States decide something uh, very. A strong or tough on China, that is the only voice from the United States, then that really scares us a lot, actually. Um, maybe the Japanese government hesitates to say that to the United States Congress or to the United States government because the you know, United States and Japan are the allies of each other. So the, it's not very easy for the Japanese government to make complain, you know, to, to complain about something which the United States decides. But, you know, the, you know, I said, you know, it scares us. It is because, you know, we have lots of people who live very close to, live in the area which is very close to Taiwan Strait, where, uh, you know, there might be, you know, real or military clash, you know, happens very in, in near future. So people are really afraid of, you know, seeing how the war is happening or even, you know, people have to be involved in the war as a, a victims of the war. So, you know, whenever we hear something, you know, new comes from the, especially the committee or the Congress, you know, which is very, you know, strong voice, you know, to be tough on China. Uh, we think, I understand it. You know, there are so many problems of China. You know, I think, you know, human rights situation should be improved in, Japan, in China. You know, diplomacy should be, you know, uh, you know, at least, you know, gradually, gradually implemented in China. But, you know, that's not the right way to do. Even if you do that, China will not change. That's not the, you know, way to try to you know improve the people's lives lives in china then you know only it, it, the things you are doing is um to just uh, escalate the tension between two countries so please don't do that you know that that's a feeling of us the japanese you know civil society well so um do you have a map that you kind of show um our listeners what uh what that relationship is between um, great. So there we are. Um, we can see Beijing and Shanghai. And yeah, right to the side of them, we see Taiwan. Yeah. And they're right there. So that's right there. And you can see where uh, Japan is from there. And then also Okinawa. Can you talk to us about Okinawa, which is uh, now uh, part of Japan? Um, and, you know, kind of the situation with Okinawa, which is a beautiful place with a um, beautiful history and the indigenous people that have lived there have suffered a lot through wars. And what is the situation for them right now? 
Thank you very much for the good question. Um, actually, the as you know, Okinawa uh, has a lot of uh, U.S. bases. Uh, you see the orange map here in the left side of this, you know, screen. Uh, the there is a long island called Okinawa. The blue shape is the Okinawa island, but uh, there is a part parts colored with red. That is the place where the U.S. base is uh occupying actually uh the okinawa uh, land uh, that is uh, almost 15 percent of the okinawa land then you know if we have only u.s bases in okinawa then without any problems that is okay i think you know maybe i shouldn't say that but that's okay but you know okinawa people or oh, for a long time uh trying to uh, get along with u.s military officials military you know service men in okinawa but you know very often, you know, the, there are rape cases, the murder cases occurs, occur in Okinawa, as well as a helicopter crash or air, aircraft sometimes, you know, drops, drops the window frame, you know, which is like a seven kilograms, uh, which is, which, you know, dropped into the playground of, you know, elementary school kind of instance always happens then you know if, even if there is a very severe crime uh, uh committed you know we cannot bring the case to the court because of the so far versus status of forces agreement so we japanese are not allowed you know and on certain condition cannot bring the, these you know cases to the court in japan so, you know, people in Okinawa very suffered from the very huge military presence in, in of the United States. Yes, you know, I can talk about the Okinawa based issues, you know, for you know, maybe like you know, one day or two days, but you know, now we are talking about China and the United States. So in the context of, you know, uh, uh, context of competition between China and, and the United States, as you see in the map, um, this red, you know, islands are called Okinawa Prefecture, Okinawa, Okinawa, you know, belong to the Okinawa Prefecture, which is one of the 47 prefectures in Japan. Then, you know, these small dots, you can, I, I can magnify it like this. You see the small islands here. You know, this is island with people, you know, people live there. Then you can tell how close it is between Taiwan and these Okinawa islands. Even, you know, at, from the coast of the nearest island of Okinawa to Taiwan, you can see Taiwan from your, you know, from Okinawa. So, you know, fishermen sometimes you know, cooperate each other to, to fish. And, you know, you know, long time ago, so they cooperate each other, and, you know, they did a very, you know, good amount of trade each other and the cultural exchange a lot. So that's a relationship between the Okinawan people and Taiwan people. But now, you know, oh, as Okinawa has a lot of US military bases there, if something happened in Taiwan, I mean, the military crash in Taiwan, military contingency in Taiwan, from where United States will send, if United States decides to send troops to Taiwan to help Taiwan people, that is actually not from uh, the United States, uh, continental uh, United States, mainland United States, but it, it is, it will be from maybe not, you know, not only from Okinawa, but from Okinawa as well as other areas in Japan. In Japan also we have, uh, like you see at the corner of this, you know, uh, PDF, uh, another base, other bases are also located in Japan. But the things I want to say is, if the United States decide to uh, support Taiwan people by sending troops to, from Japan to uh, from from the United States to Taiwan, that is not from the United States. That is from Japan. It means we will be, you know, retaliated by China. You know, may, maybe immediately after the United States decide to send troops from Japan to Taiwan or yeah, maybe, uh, you know, a few, few days later, you know, we have to be, you know, damaged by that from China. So now we really believe well, that. I mean, let's just hope that this never happens. I just yeah. want to start there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, <laughs> the Chinese government is not going to attack Taiwan because it's China and China will not attack itself. So, but what we see happening is the U.S. being provocative in the China seas. And that's where you're talking about is where the, all that provocation is happening. So it's probably going to happen on the seas, not on the island of Taiwan, because 
that would it would mean the United States would have to attack Taiwan because China is not going to attack Taiwan. Ta Taiwan is China. So um, so what we see is all this provoca provocation happening on the water. We see lots of U.S. military ships surrounding Taiwan. So and you know the U.S. is preparing for war, which is a very dangerous situation. When you prepare for war, it usually means war is inevitable. But what I'm what I'm seeing is that Okinawa is right there in those waters where all this provocation will be happening. Um, you know, I know you could talk a lot about Okinawa, but you know, for our listeners, it's a it's a beautiful, pristine, you know, coral reefs and and fantastic wildlife. And this is a place that's been used for war, not by the choice of the people who live on Okinawa, but it's really been occupied by the US military. Um, could you explain what a prefecture is for Japan? You know, so the US military basically occupies Okinawa, but it's part of Japan. If you could kind of explain that you know, contradiction for us, um, that would be good. Oh, uh, yes. I just wanted to show, you know, how beautiful Okinawa is, but I cannot find the best picture of it. Maybe you can insert the picture later. <laughs> but um, yes, Okinawa is a very beautiful place. And I, I think that you, I mean, if any listeners are going to get married, why don't you choose Okinawa as your destination for your honeymoon? I think that's the best way to go, I guess. Yeah, but um, yes, Okinawa was a, a kingdom for a long time until like 200 years ago. Then Japan annexed Okinawa. Uh, so they lost their own kingdom. Then they are now losing their language and they, they are losing their cultures. Then, you know, uh, as I told you, uh, Yes, and Okinawa have a, has a lot of US presence uh, as a, a basis in their land, but that is because in, we Japanese lost the war uh, during the Second World Second World War. Then uh, Okinawa battle was a very you know infamous battle. Then you know one fourth of people, including American soldiers and of course the Okinawan people, are uh, you know had to die you know because of the very severe battle there. Then, you know, the outcome from the war is occupation by the United States until 1972, you know, since 1945. And then that was the United States. No, it was a part of Japan, but occupied by the United States. Then during that time, the United States created a lot of bases, military bases, you know, which Japanese didn't have any chance to say anything because the occupation was done by the United States. Then in addition to that, in the, the, the photos in front of you is the uh, new construction plan right now going on. So, you know, for us, you know, for Americans, maybe the war ended, the, the Pacific War ended right after, I, I think, the August, you know, 1945. But for the Okinawan people, still the war is continuing, kind of. You know, not the war, war itself, but, oh no, you know, they, they have to... Uh, oppose the decision made by the mainland Japan and the United States, which the Japanese Okinawan, Okinawan people doesn't have any chance to say anything about, then, you know, this, you know, plan is for new marine base uh, in Okinawa, of course, for the United States Marines, but um, then they have been, you know, strongly working, you know, to oppose the new construction for already like about 20 years. But when, while they are very busy opposing the new construction, now, you know, United States started a very massive military exercises with the United States, with Japan and other, uh, sometimes even European countries in the Okinawa see to data China, data runs, data runs, data runs. That's a keyword for all military exercises and this, you know, the base in front of you and, you know, other bases in Okinawa and also new missiles try to introduce into Okinawa. You know, these, you know, I would say like, a, you know, huge new um, installment of the military facilities, uh, you know, always with excuse to data China. But no, data means you know, to secure somebody else, right? But is Okinawan people secured by these military actions? Actually not. 
you know, maybe American people would be, you know, you know, secured by the military presence in Japan. But maybe Tokyo, I'm now in Tokyo, so my life will be maybe protect, protected by that. But, you know, Okinawa people are really afraid. If you decide to introduce okay. me... No, wait, 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 wait. We cannot, we cannot say these things. Okay. Not, no one is made secure by weapons no. and war. That doesn't make anyone secure. It just yeah, makes them dead. Yeah. So um, the fact that we can have this conversation or listen to people try to convince us mm -hmm. that somehow all these weapons and these bases are going to protect anyone. I mean, ask the Okinawans about what happened during the war. No one on like, Okinawa was protected by those bases. They were killed because those bases were there. If there's a, I mean, if there's a war, what would be attacked but the U.S. bases that are closest to China? I mean, it literally is like putting the war on their front lawn. That is, you know, there's no, it's a lie. When, when there's a U.S. military base on your island, you're the one that will be attacked. And they know that from World War II. And so what we're, and what you just said is very powerful that the war ended in 1945, but the war has not ended on the people in Okinawa. And you said earlier about the rapes and about the murders and having absolutely no access to justice for what's happening to them is criminal. And so here we are on the front lines of this war that the US is pushing. And what you're saying is, the people of Okinawa are already paying the price. And I know they have fought that base for a very, very long time. Now you were showing me that um, a, a, a poll was done about how people in Japan feel about um, the, the US war on China. And you know we see Japan as an ally of the US, but um, yes, here, Here's a um, a public opinion poll. If you could tell us a little bit about this poll. Yes, you know, um, as I told you that the Japanese people are really afraid of the Taiwan Strait, possible Taiwan Strait war. The, this number shows that, you know, 80% of people are really concerned about the uh, war. They know not only about the war itself, but also we have to be involved in the war. That's a feeling. If something happened there that is very close to us, then, then we are recognized as allies of the ally of the United States. It means, and then also the Japanese government, you know, high, you know even like a vice prime minister said, we are ready to fight against the, you know, the fight in the war. I don't think they said that. He said that, like, you know, just 10 days ago. So, you know, government says that, but you know, we are really concerned. We are not very happy about, you know, to be involved in the war, which is not the war of us, which is, you know, of course, the war shouldn't be, you know, of anybody, but it definitely it's not the war of us. Then we will not start the war, but why do we have to get involved in the war? That's a feeling of us. That's the first public poll. Then second one is kind of shocking, shocking not only to the Japanese government, but shocking to the American government as well, I think. It says, you know, 75, almost 75% of Japanese people disagree to send Japanese self-defense force, I mean, troops of Japan, uh, send Japanese troops to Taiwan to, uh, you know, help American forces. But, you know, the vice prime minister of Japan said, we are ready to send troops to Taiwan to help American people, American government. Then American officials usually said, you know, if you know Japanese government will help us to fight against China, that would be very helpful. Like you know, these are conversations between two governments. Yeah, but and I mean, I think that's because the people of Japan can look at the people of uh, Ukraine. Mm, see, mm. You know, the U.S. pushing the war on the Ukrainians, promising weapons, telling them they'll have their back. They're pushing NATO. They're pushing this war that ends up to be, you know, Russia bombing Ukraine. But who's dying? I it's know. The Ukrainians. the Ukrainians are dying. And they're on the front lines. You know, we've just heard that there's 200% casualty rate on this in this war. And there, there's no U.S. soldiers are dying. Let's just look at, you know, here. this is, you know, U.S. generals have said this is a proxy war on Russia. 
and that they're not ending. They won't go to the diplomacy table until they've defeated Russia, but they are doing this war with Ukrainian soldiers. There's no, you, you know, very few American soldiers over there. There are mostly Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian civilians who are being put on the front lines and slaughtered. So of course, I would understand the Japanese people having watched what's happening in Ukraine, be very concerned about what could happen to them in the US war on China. Um, I thank you so much for showing us these numbers. Uh, these are greater numbers than what we see, you know, in the United States. And like you said earlier, like why you started the new diplomacy initiative is that we're not listening to the voices that are on the front lines of this possible war. And um, thank you for raising this up because I think these are voices we should be hearing. So um, also I wanted to ask you, you know, this is two nuclear powers. This is the end where, you know, we live in a time where all we should be thinking about, especially after this horrible summer of so much devastation and heat and flooding, we all should be cooperating on climate change. Instead, we're still hearing the drumbeats of war that would be two nuclear powers. And, you know, you're from Japan. You have suffered the, the unthinkable. I would assume that that's one of the great fears that um, must be in the hearts of those from Japan around this confrontation. Yes, um, the logic of the governments is always like, you know, extended deterrence of nuclear uh, weapons. So in order to have you know peace in their world, uh, peace we have to have nuclear weapons, nuclear umbrellas to keep us safe. But you know we have experience of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. Then once you know uh, it was used, it is used. Nobody can survive anymore. But not 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 only nobody, but this globe will you know be devastated just at all. So, you know, threat to use nuclear, data means to use the threat of nuclear weapons, right? To, otherwise it cannot deter anybody. So um, we cannot rely on the power of nuclear weapons anymore. That's what we learned already like almost 80 years ago. That is 80, almost 80 years ago, 78 years ago. So, so I'm very frustrated to see the outcome of the G7 Hiroshima summit. You know, there's the seven countries, prime minister and president wanted to use the name of Hiroshima to show, you know, how they are cooperating with each other. But, you know, with the name of Hiroshima, they said, you know, deterrence by nuclear weapons is very important. It, you know, actually triggered the anger of Hiroshima survivors and atomic bomb survivors and Nagasaki su survivors. So don't use nuclear weapon as an excuse, you know, for peace. You know, it's not going to make any peace at all. So we have to understand that, you know, from our experience. You know, it's not because of the American people's fault, you know, maybe some of them, but the Japanese government always said we have to do that in order to make the better world. We have to have the nuclear umbrella, you know, for now. They always say, for now, we need it. Now we have to have it. But when you can say that we don't need it, you know, now is the time to do it. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. And I think with this film, Oppenheimer, out right now, where it's finally being talked about that those two bombs were unnecessarily dropped by a brutal US president who was just trying to flex a muscle at Stalin and with the costing the lives, uh, the innocent lives of those people who lived in Nagasaki and Hiroshima is criminal, but you know, there's no one being held accountable. And instead we have to get rid of these horrible weapons that um, really are, you know, a dark shadow over all of our heads. And as you said, if they're used, it, it's a nuclear winter and we won't be surviving that. Um, so yes. Um, I wonder if there's any other issues that you wanna discuss with our audience from the viewpoint of um, Japan sitting very next to, um, you know, what the US is pushing. Thank you for asking. Um, 
the United States is, you know, very important country, actually the still superpower in the world. So I go to the Washington DC, then try to meet with, you know, high rank officials or, uh, or sen you know, senators and congressmen with not only by me, but by me, but with, you know, say like a former prime minister or, you know, minister or that members. But it's not very easy to work together with American people. You know, always they said we are very busy. And also, you know, we have, you know, Japan is a very important country, but still there are so many things we have to work on. So. The things I want to say is it's not very easy to work together with American people, but I understand you know I like United States very much. That's why I live in the United States. I have lots of you know great friends you know who try to change the world towards the better better future. So I really respect that. But I think you know we have to work together internationally. It's, otherwise, we cannot change the world anymore. So international solidarity is very important. So, you know, it's not very easy to work together with somebody who don't speak very good English or who don't understand the culture, but we have to work together. That's, it please, and I think the people who watch this, you know, listen to this, you know, interview already understand it. So there is no meaning to tell that to you, but still, you know, international, you know, cooperation is the, you know, only things we can change, the, the by which we can change the world. Please, you know, uh, consider that even more than now. That's what I want to say. Well, that was beautiful. What a great sentiment to leave on because it is international solidarity that we need for the people and for the planet, that there's no greater contributor to climate change than war. And so let us be cooperating, yeah. uh, especially in this moment in history. Thank you so much for all you do. And thanks for sharing your voice with us today. Yes to diplomacy, yes to cooperation, and I just celebrate your work. Sayo, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Judy.